Before we crack on with the video, I just wanted to let you know that iDriver Classic is sponsored by Adrian Flux. I've also got all my cars insured with them and I also have Flux Rescue because guess what? All my cars do break down even if I pretend they don't. If you haven't got your car insured yet or you're looking for a new renewal quote, click the link below and get in touch with the Adrian Flux team. Hi guys, it's Steph from iDriver Classic and today I'm back with a very interesting and different car on the channel. It's the lovely pre-war Austin 18, affectionately known as ALF. I've borrowed him off my friend Mark today. I felt a little bit nervous about it because it's not my usual area, but also quite excited because as we go through this video today, you'll see that ALF not only has a rich history to him he's got so many unique qualities that you will have never seen on another car and i think you're going to really enjoy he might be in the slow lane he might be forgotten by a large number of the population but let me show you alf today because i think this video might really win you over on the austin 18. we'll kick off with a walk around and then we'll meet the owner mark the austin 18 was introduced in july 1937 and was discontinued in September 1939, the month that Britain announced they'd be entering the Second World War. The car had great ambitions and had Austin's early hallmarks, like forward-thinking design, a daring-to-be-different attitude, and quality by the bucket load. Because a lot of people, when they think of Austin, people that are a fan of more modern classic cars, they think of things like the Allegro or the Metro. And so when they think of Austin, they think, oh well you know it's a bit thrown together it's a bit rubbish but actually really this car represents the golden age of Austin when the cars that they made were absolutely astounding and really market leading in some of their approaches. So when it came to market the car was issued in a variety of colours which again was quite pushing it for the time so you could have got royal blue, black like this car, maroon, deep coach green, ash grey and what I'm probably going to pronounce incorrectly Pueblo Brown, which sounds a little bit sketchy. Upholstery was either leather or cloth, and you were going to be paying around £5 more for the leather upholstery because that came as part of the deluxe package. Now, when this car came to market, it came to market with 18 key points, and it was all throughout all the literature. So the 18 points were as follows. Number one, it was a silent and efficient six-cylinder engine with the downdraft carburation giving over 50 brake horsepower, which for the time was pretty good. Modern sound insulated bodywork with draft free ventilation and flush fitting sliding roof. And in fact, it's important to note when talking about this car that every single body panel on this car is sound insulated, which as you'll see when we go for a drive, makes it actually a very quiet affair. And as you'll see when we get in later on, you've got ample seating for seven adults. It's not just marketing spiel, it's true. And you've got adjustable seats to front and rear. And the way that they did this was they mounted the engine nine inches further forward than the predecessor, which meant that it increased the space on the chassis and in turn, they were then able to build more cabin space for the passengers. And as well as insulating those body panels, it had complete insulation for the engine and for the transmission system. And it had a four-speed box on it. And very modern for the time, it had synchro on second, third and fourth gear. You've got fascia hand control for the, mecha the mechanical girling brakes, or for those in the know, the girling rod brakes. And these weren't anything new for this, and they'd been used on the Austin 14 as well. You've got long springs of low periosi periosity with positive lubrication and hydraulic shock absorbers, very wide door and flat floor with no transmission tunnels or foot wells. The reason they did this was so it had complete comfort and you could move around completely inside. And in fact, the doors open an impressive 31 inches wide. As you can see, it's got exceptional visibility all around and you have that triplex tough and glass, not only in the front screen, but in the windows round it as well. You also have the four wheel permanent hydraulic jacking system, which unfortunately I wasn't able to show you today. You've got a spare wheel and luggage compartment and when sold, it came with two fitted suitcases. Sadly, through the passage of time, these have been lost for this particular car. You've also got improved steering on this called the Miles Weller steering with adjustable wheel as well. And you've got easy clean wheels and large extra low pressure tyres. 
In addition to this, you've got a large dial illuminated instruments. Now things like this might seem really basic to us today, but at the time were really high spec and seen as very desirable. You've also got the foot operated dip and switch headlights. So you might've seen this on other cars as well. It's very common for the time. And you've got a 12 volt electrical system with a compensated voltage control. Now you might say to me, well, that's pretty normal, isn't it? But remember at the time, this wasn't kind of standard thing because a lot of cars were still being sold on six volt electrics. Cars like the Model T, for it, Model T, was it? No, the Model A was sold on six volt electric as well. So even Ford was still using it. You also have pump cooling controlled by thermostat and automatic return direction indicators, or as we might say today, self-canceling trafficators. Talk about this quite a lot in the video because I was quite impressed by it. And you've also got a gearbox controlled reversing light. Now this is a very modern touch because even cars like the Morris Minor, which were sold over a decade later, still didn't have that on. Now, because this car has a very short production life, the literature support to support has been very limited. So all of the facts I've told you today have come out of the sales brochure, which was issued at the time. So many thanks to the owner of the car because he's actually obtained those and shared them with me today to make this video. But a lot of people will say to me, Steph, who would own a car like this today in the modern age? And is it that usable? And most importantly, why would you buy a car like this? So I did decided to ask the owner, Mark, to tell us a little bit more to camera. So over to you, Mark. Hi, I'm Mark, and this is my 1938 Austin, uh, affectionately known as Alfie. Uh, and I've owned him since 2003. And I think it's the wrong word, owned. It's, I'm a custodian. Um, I've had so much fun and enjoyment out of this car. It's one car that I would never, ever want to sell. So. It's been great to do this video and, and lots of thanks to Steph so I can show people what a wonderful, wonderful car and what wonderful pre-war motoring is. I know I probably sound really weirdly sentimental, but it's so nice showing you a car like Alf because can you believe there are only 16 left of these fantastic cars? And you'll see when we do a bit of a tour around the inside that it's not just a car, it's so much more. And there's so much that's been packed into this vehicle that I think unless you do an up close review like this, you don't really appreciate. But I didn't think it was gonna be a cheap deal anyway, because I think it cost when it was new around 355 pounds, which in comparable buying terms for the time, it's about what it would have cost to buy a three bed semi. So you weren't somebody, if you were buying one of these, who was just the average Joe, it was probably that upper level of management, someone with a good amount of cash to spend, the sort of car that maybe the council would invest in for the town hall to welcome visitors and show them around. It's an impressive car. And I hope that today that me showing the inside, taking out for a drive really gives you a feel for that. There's something I should mention is whoever owned Alf, first of all, must have had a little bit of extra cash because they've had this sunroof installed. Now this sunroof was an extra £10 and there's even a little badge up here telling you who put that into the car. So love these little details. Now something else I wanted to talk to you about is if you've got an older car, you may have heard of Desmo who make the roof racks. That's what most people know them for. But at some point they must have made mad little sun visors because this sun visor here, which actually isn't much help at all, be better off with a pair of sunglasses, was made by Desmo. It was something that was original to the car. However, on the passenger side, you do get that more conventional. Needs a bit of WD-40 leather sun visor that over there you've got the rear view mirror again people look at that and just think oh it's a small bit of glass but actually it's perfectly cut so that me as the driver i can see that back window perfectly it's very thoughtfully done now, if you've watched the standard nine and the standard 10 videos, you'll remember these these are how we get the wipers onto the screen so you pull it and you twist it down and that places onto the screen. Just place those above for now. Coming below that, we have got the glove box. As you can see, that's quite a spacious area there, so you can get quite a lot in there. Coming into the middle, we've got our ashtray. 
love fancy detailing like that see little details like this really hark back to that art deco era it's nice that now this here this is if you remember i'm sure it was again one of the standards where you could turn that and it just pushes the screen forward you see it sometimes on series land rovers as well now coming down in front of us you might have thought that you were only going to get the bare basics but actually we've got a fair bit of kit so you've got a speedo which runs up to well i'm not being funny we're not going to hit 80 miles an hour are we what looks to be a trip clock which is incredibly forward thinking because there are cars made in the 70s that don't have them and you've got a wind up clock there did ask if that worked but i've been told that it works when it's out on the bench but as soon as it goes back into the car it stops working again the lights are incredibly canny you just turn these here so it's off side and headlights of course down on the floor there you have got your main beam really this carried on using that sort of technology until like the 60s so that should be pretty familiar to a lot of people at home over on the right hand side you've got amp meter oil pressure gauge and petrol gauge there as well this little tiny switch here is just for when you put the wipers on the screen you flick that and then you just get the normal wiping motion well i mean the clap hands it's more like that actually anyway coming in the center i hope this isn't a shape of things to come alf is playing games with me and won't demonstrate his horn but in terms of indicators it is trafficators or semaphores on this so it's over to the left and over to the right and in the center you've got your horn push now one of the great things about this car is that and you sometimes you don't even see it on rolls royces of this era is that these semaphores are self-cancelling which do you know what is brilliant because sometimes when you don't have a light flashing at you you do forget to turn them off now over on this side you've got this little button and you've got it on the passenger side there as well there's a light there at the back that originally would have popped that on unfortunately that doesn't work but with Alf being of such a vintage I think I can forgive him a few little bits and pieces that he needs to sort out so that's it in a bit of a quick whistle stop tour but one of the amazing things about Alf is is the fun doesn't stop here because I'm actually now going to take you in the back before I start this car if you said to me today the car that I was going to enjoy the most wasn't going to be the Dolomite Sprint, it was going to be this, I wouldn't have believed you. But actually, Alf, this incredible Austin 18, has blown me away with everything on offer. Because for me, when you take people out in your car, it's not just about what the driver experiences. And I've talked about this on other car reviews. It's also about what happens with your passengers as well. And this is probably the best passenger experience. I'd rather be driven, actually, than drive this because it is brilliant. So let me show you some of the bits we've got on offer as keep looking around because it's so good. Well, first of all, let's talk about this leg room because I have got so much leg room. I'm five foot three and my legs are nearly fully stretched out in the back. It's kind of like if you think about those taxis, you've almost got as much leg room as a taxi. It's brilliant. And as well as that... We've got, wait for it, a pop down blind. So I just popped it back there. I feel like the more I've used this, as I've, I've shot this section several times, the more it's popped back. These little windows come back, they're triplex toughened for those of you that like the small details. Just get that back in, it's quite stiff. We've got a little ashtray down here so I can have a smoke on the go. Got an armrest here, an armrest here, which I share with whoever the lucky person is sitting next to me. The seats are fully upholstered in leather. They're so comfortable, you have no idea. They're better than any sofa that I have sat on in years. They're brilliant. So we've got all of that, which I think would be enough in itself with the fantastic legroom. But we have got foot rests, and as well as that, for the days that we're stopping for those picnics. We have got, da -da -da -da, and as many times as I pull this out, it's still just as stiff. These incredible picnic tables. There's one for me, there's one for the person next to me. Now, it's funny because there are only two, but actually on the advertising literature for the car, it did show three in the front and three in the back. But I think if you're going to enjoy this to its full potential, you'd only really want two. 
So that's the back of the car in a bit of a whistle stop tour. I've shown you the front. I'm going to get Alf started up and then we're going to take him out for a drive because as you can see, this car delivers an awful lot for A, the era, B, the price that you can get them for nowadays and C, just for a car in general, there's so much going on. It's so luxurious. I never would have expected this from an Austin. So yeah, fantastic and pleasantly surprised. Let's get him started up. I've shown you in the front and I've shown you in the back, but let me start the car up so you can hear what he sounds like. Are you ready? <laughs> it actually sounds really good. Now we'll pop round to the back and you can hear what Alf sounds like from outside too. We're ready to set off, but something I wanted to tell you before, in case you hadn't spotted it already, we don't have seat belts in this Austin. So please don't panic if you see me driving without one, it's merely that we don't have them inside the vehicle. Now this is a bit of a funny one, because first gear tends to only be used in these for climbing up like massive hills at five miles per hour, we're actually gonna set off in second. It's a four speed box and we've got synchro on second, third and fourth. So I'll just take you through that as we drive. I'm going to do up the window as well. So smooth. I think you're going to be really impressed with this actually. even hit 30 miles per hour we are up into top gear number one is that it is so quiet inside the vehicle there are no knocks no rattles no bangs and you can't hear wind coming in or any drafts and this vehicle was made before world war ii had even kicked off it's incredible quality really another thing that took me by surprise is that it's quite nippy you can really put your foot down and we're kind of trundling along there if you think there probably about 30 miles per hour she's no speed demon even though we have got that near two and a half liter straight six under the bonnet and when i asked mark how fast we should be going he said really he wouldn't like to take the car above 45 miles per hour the dear old alf is a funny car because when i first saw him in the barn i thought oh no <laughs> what am i doing testing an austin 18 that looks massive but actually once you're inside this gentle giant feels very easy to maneuver and you know what if you've ever driven i'm going to try and think up some really good comparisons so the steering on this is lighter than it is in a morris minor and the brakes are pretty good too so i'm just going to break there for you to show you you are on girling rod brakes, but you just, I think it's all about reading the road ahead. And this is the thing. So I was talking to Mark and I said, what do you think puts people off these older cars? Because a lot of people my age and younger will look at stuff like this and think, absolutely no way am I going near that. And I really, I think it's just down to education because once you've got the hang of being in something that's a little bit older, like a Morris Minor, for example, and you get used to reading that road ahead, take those skills, take that knowledge and apply it to this. And those brakes aren't a problem. And for those of you that would say, oh, you know, you wouldn't want to take that car very far. Mark's taken Alf all the way to Holland. I mean, yeah, it was the Hull to Rotterdam ferry, but it's still a pretty considerable distance for a car of this age. But as you can see, a lot of stuff of this era, you have to end up double declutching and it just gets a bit iffy. But as you've seen, probably as we go up and down through this box, 
we're not having to do lots of laborious movement to try and get it through. It's actually a relatively easy car to drive. It's funny, you know, because the more of the vehicles that I take out of this age, do you remember, if you are new to the channel, you may not know, a few months ago, I took out a standard nine and a standard 10, and I remarked that they were a lot more modern than I was expecting. And dear old Alf, I'm gonna put him in the same box because it's actually, <laughs> it actually feels a lot more refined than I thought it was going to. And it's very light. I mean, I would put anybody in this and I think that they would fare up quite well actually because the steering is so light and he handles very well. It's very responsive as you come around these corners. I wasn't expecting it really. Now as we bring Alf through like a little town setting, you can see you can keep up with traffic absolutely fine and as the roads of Britain become more and more clogged, speed really isn't something you need to be worrying about because you can't build up any speed anyway. Now that's it from me today really. So. I guess it's a funny one because if you've never taken out something of this age, you might be a little bit nervous to try it. But trust me, an Austin 18 drives just as well, if not better actually, than a Morris Minor of kind of, you know, a later Morris Minor. It's lighter to handle. Yes, it is a little bit slower, but it's certainly quieter inside the cabin. And it feels like a far more luxurious drive as well. And I think we need to be a little bit creative about some of the classic cars that we're looking at because a lot of the popular stuff now is going up in value enormously and the parts availability isn't any really better than something like this. And when you take out something like this, as you will have seen from the inside, we have the picnic tables and we've got the lovely padded seats that are so comfortable. Instead of going for one of the more talked about classic cars, why not go for something pre-war like this that you get just as much fun from, but far more luxury and it's just as easy to drive. I think we all need to start thinking about cars like this because, and without sounding too blunt, the typical audience, the typical fan base isn't somebody like Mark in his uh, <clears throat> early 40s. It's more like somebody in their 80s and their 70s and within 20 years that target audience is going to be so small that these cars will become endangered species so we need to start appreciating stuff like this we need to get it out and we need to start looking after it and putting it on the wish list because they're good fun to drive the handling is so good that I think I could put somebody who'd only been in power assisted cars into this and they wouldn't panic and it's something that you can fix and maintain at home yourself with just a few manuals and a bit of careful running. That's it from me today. I've really enjoyed this Austin 18, far more than I thought I was going to. It's an enjoyable little car. Alf has been an exceptional example and Mark has been a very generous host in lending me the car. So if you haven't subscribed already, make sure you do. And until next time, take care and drive safely.